Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Well, we are in the middle of uh, our series in Genesis. So if you have a Bible, open up to chapter 25. We're going to start there today. Um, but before we do, uh, just a little thought experiment to kind of get us in the right, in the right mindset. Um, I'd like you to take a second and to think about your family. Maybe not the, the family if you're a uh, husband and wife with kids in the house. Maybe not the immediate family in your home. Uh, your extended family. Think about uh, your siblings, your aunts and uncles, your grandparents, maybe a distant cousin or two, right? Think about your family members. Now, I'm sure some of you, when you think of some of them, uh, there's this lightness. There's a joy that comes over you like, man, they're such a servant. They're a lover of people. Man, they're so generous, and I love being around their presence. And I'm sure there's some other family members where that's maybe not the case, <laughs> where it's a little bit more of a drama to be around them, where there's a certain level of dysfunction. Now, the level of dysfunction I'm talking about is maybe not just bad breath, like a halitosis issue or uh, a flatulence issue. You know, sometimes older people, they, they have the sugar-free candies because they're mildly diabetic, and that the sugar-free, you know what the sugar-free does. So um, that's not the dysfunction I'm referring to. It's really the dysfunction uh, behind the curtain, the addictions, the manipulation, the narcissism, the always playing the victim card. Certain things about their personality that unless you're kind of family, you don't know them. But if you're family, you kind of know all their idiosyncrasies and faults. Well, today, so you think your family's bad. <laughs> We're going to look at a pretty messed up family uh, in the book of Genesis. A family that God chooses to push his promise through the promise of raising up a nation, uh, one that would know him, that would follow him, and we're going to come on the scene with a pretty jacked up family, and uh, hopefully that'll give us hope that God does indeed operate and move through and transform messed up people so that he can accomplish his will. That should give you and I hope, amen? All right, so let's pray and we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, thank you God for your word, and your presence. God, that these two things are a constant guide to our heart and our mind and our decisions and who we are. And God, I pray that those two this morning, God, would illuminate our heart, open up our minds to see who you have designed us to be, and that, God, we could walk in your way and not in our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, uh, turn to chapter 25. We're going to look at these two brothers, Jacob and Esau. Uh, we're going to cover basically Jacob's whole story arc this morning, and then we're going to pull out four key lessons. We're going to look at four scenes. We're going to pull out four key lessons, all right? So the setup to where we're going to start here in Genesis 25. Last week, we left off with, with, off with Abraham. Uh, recognizing that Isaac is the son of promise. Well, that's who we're going to follow. Isaac uh, is uh, at home. His father, Abraham, sends out a servant to go back to his hometown and find Isaac a wife. Through a set of crazy circumstances, the servant finds Rebecca. And so Rebecca and Isaac get married. Abraham dies. And then this is where we're going to pick up the story in verse 19. Genesis 25, verse 19. This is the account of the family of Isaac, the son of Abraham. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Amran. Wow. I practiced that earlier and I tongue twisted myself. I, I, don't, I think if I didn't practice that, it would have been fine. Anyway, uh, Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Amran. Aram, and the sister of Laban the Armenian. Now, underline, if you got your Bible, underline Laban. Laban's going to come back later in the story. Whew, 
He's an interesting character. So Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. So just like Abraham and Sarah struggled, Isaac and Rebekah struggled. So Isaac pleaded with the Lord. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. The two children struggled with each other in her womb, so she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older, bro- and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat. So he named him Esau, which means hairy. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob, heel grabber or deceiver, which we'll get into. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born. So he was married at 40. Twins came 20 years later. Wow. As the boys grew up, verse 27, as the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was outdoorsman. But Jacob had a quiet temperament, preferring to stay at home near his mama. Esau loved, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game Esau brought home, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So here's our introduction to our four main characters, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau, and we begin to see a little bit dysfunction of their relationship with one another. Though it's dysfunctional, there's a functional God that works through all this dysfunction, and that's the God we serve. Amen. So how messed up is this family? Well, number one, they're just fallen sinner human beings, just like you and me. So uh, we got that in, in the, the, the negative column, all right? So they're jacked up, prideful, sinful, unfaithful, and rebellious. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that mom and dad are not on the same page. Mom and dad are not on the same page. One is pointed towards one son and favors him. The other is pointed towards the other son and favors that one. And when mom and dad are not moving in the same direction, there's a problem in the framework of the family. There's conflict. There's hardship. And there's heartache. That always follows. Have you ever experienced that? Maybe being brought up in a home where mom and dad were not on the same page and you suffered the ramifications, the fruit of that disunity. Or maybe you're living it within your own home. If you're married and have a spouse and there's maybe some thoughts as this gets brought up, man, there may, there, we might not be on the same page. The encouragement is to get on the same page. They're not walking together in unity. Mom and dad are not being on the same page. It helps compound this rivalry in between Esau and Jacob. So much like his father Abraham, like I said, it took 20 years for Rebecca to get married. I'm sure, now I just kind of sat with that, 20 years. Now you imagine Abraham's lingering around. Now Abraham was the one that got the original call, the son of promise, Isaac, you're the son of promise. And I'm sure Rebecca, after 20 years, kind of got tired of hearing about the son of promise, because I cannot get pregnant. Tired of hearing it. Well, Isaac seems bent when it comes to his sons. Isaac has an older half-brother, Ishmael, like we talked about last week, who despised him because he was not the son of promise, but Isaac was. Now, one would assume that Rebekah would have told Isaac what the Lord told her concerning their sons. There's maybe an assumption there. It doesn't say outright, but you'd think being in relationship for that long, uh, waiting on the promise of God, that she would have shared that. Um, And Isaac's like, I don't really care. This one brings me venison, right? He's the manly man of the two. He's the one I favor. He's the one that feeds my appetite. I love his game. Because my appetite is what rules me, Isaac. Esau, 
is just like his father, driven by his appetite, which we'll see in a second. And Jacob, his name, like I said, heel grabber, schemer, conniver, deceiver. God's using this family? Really? This family, as dysfunctional as this introductory salvo is. Wow. How are they going to be useful to God? It is only by God's call and God's promise that is going to make things happen. God's trying to get through to Isaac that he, and he alone, is the animator of life and the purpose giver of life. It's me, Isaac. Don't you understand? Unless I brought forth life from the womb of your wife, you would not have any children today? It's about me, not about you, Isaac. So lesson number one. Families in disunion with God and each other create dysfunction. Families in disunion with God and each other, the fruit of it is dysfunction. Without a vision, the people perish, and so do families. So do families. I've seen married couples get married, and then they still kind of keep their own independent life a part of it. And it's kind of like, I got my thing, and you kind of got your thing, and Well, maybe we'll kind of meet in the middle for the really necessary things. Not learning to yield to one another, to defer to one another, to communicate one's true heart to one another, to learn how to be a team together, to create a home that honors God. God needs a united team with Him and each other. That's His desire and design. All right, let's move on. Genesis 25, 29. Then one day... When Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau arrived home from the wilderness, exhausted and hungry. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved. Give me some of the red stew. All right, Jacob replied, but trade me your birthright as the firstborn son. Hey, really, bro? You're going for the whole jugular, man. He must be super exhausted and hungry. Man, he's trying... Imagine, he's using his brother's most weakest point to seize an opportunity to get one over on him. Wow. Look, I'm dying of starvation, said Esau. What good is my birthright to me now? But Jacob said, first you must swear that your birthright is mine. So Esau swore an oath, thereby selling all his rights as the firstborn to his brother Jacob. Then... Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then got up and left. He showed contempt for his rights as the firstborn. Wow. Here's Esau, driven by his own appetite, just like his father. He's so hungry that he's willing to trade any and everything that he had. Fully short-sighted, fully in the tyranny of the urgent. What do I need? Anything else does not matter. He's like, I want that red stew. You want my birthright? All right, deal. My appetite is so large, it's got to be satisfied right now. Listen, Jacob, I've got no long-term vision for my life. I'm not really living beyond uh, the here and now. It doesn't matter to me. I'm hungry. Thank you very much. So Esau swears an oath and gives his rights, gives his birthright to his brother, a wild exchange. Now, the text draws out an obvious question as you're reading it. Am I like Esau, who has been trading their birthright in God, being accepted into his family, filled and made new by his spirit, walking in faithfulness and integrity before the Lord? Is there an area in your life where you are trading all of that for what your flesh is craving? Because it's a bad deal. And when you read it on a page, you're like, how could he ever be that stupid? And then we look in the mirror. How could we be that stupid? Lord, help me. Lord, help me not be governed by my flesh, but help me be governed by your spirit. Comfort, security, lust, pornography, pleasure, things that you turn to escape from the real world doing things your way where you're in control, all of that, any of these things that we turn to, 
blind us. Blind us and we trade. And we trade who we are in God, our inheritance with God, for a simple meal to satisfy our flesh. Lesson number two, don't trade your birthright in God for anything. Do not trade your birthright in God for anything that the world has to offer. All right. So we move forward to chapter 27. This becomes round three in the fight between Jacob and Esau. Now round one, we saw in the womb. They were womb mates. All right, sad, dad joke. All right, okay. The second fight we just covered, trades his birthright. Third fight, here it comes. Round three, this is now 37 years after chapter 25. Isaac is now 137 years old, and he's failing. His eyesight's failing. He thinks he's about to die. One of the main reasons is because Isaac's half-brother Ishmael that we mentioned earlier, he died at 137. So I'm sure that if, you know, Isaac comes around to his 137th birthday, he begins thinking, my brother died at the same age. I need to get my house in order even though he's going to live for 43 more years. So that's another caveat. But he thinks he's going to die, so he's got to get his house in order. i got to get this blessing thing all sewn up, sewed up. So he calls his son, tells him that he's ready to bless him, Esau. Before I die, go hunt some wild game and prepare my favorite dish, then I will bless you. So Isaac insisted on giving the blessing to Esau, the one whom God did not choose, who despised his birthright, and who also married numerous pagan wives. It seems Isaac rejected God's thinking and spiritual wisdom and instead thought only food of food and common man-centered ideas of might make right. He's mighty. This other son is weak. The, uh, the choice is obvious. There's no way, Rebecca, you, you misheard God. He's totally discounting the word of the Lord over his sons. And so Rebecca overhears this conversation. And she goes back to Jacob and she says, listen, my son, I want you to do exactly what I tell you to do. And so through the assistance of Rebecca, the wife of she dresses up her youngest son to look and smell like Esau. And she fixes a meal, the meal, for Jacob, for Isaac. And she gives him the meal. This is her concocted plan. This is her way to manipulate what she thinks God wants, which is accurate, but she's using manipulative ways to get it done. So we pick up Genesis 27, verse 18. So here comes Jacob, dressed up like his older brother, afraid that he might be deceiving. And it's like, no, bro, you are deceiving. So here we go. Verse 18. So Jacob took the food to his father. My father, he said. Yes, my son, Isaac answered. Who are you, Esau or Jacob? Jacob replied, and I'm sure he might have dressed up his voice, you know. It's Esau, your firstborn son. I've done as you told me. Here is the wild game. Now sit up and eat it so you can give me your blessing. Isaac asked, how did you find it so quickly, my son? Ooh, Jacob replied, the Lord your God put it in my path. Oh, Jacob. Oh, Jacob, you just crossed the line. His mama taught him well. He's a deceiver who is using God to further his own agenda. This is the definition of taking the Lord's name in vain. Taking the Lord lightly on your lips, using his name in such a way where you empty of, it, of its real meaning and you try to use your name for your own agenda, his name for your own agenda. You see that today in our world and we see it here in Jacob. Jacob, the scoundrel, did not hesitate to give credit to God as a part of the deception. 
Then Isaac said to Jacob, come closer so I can touch you and make sure that you really are Esau. He had some doubts still. So Jacob went closer to his father and Isaac touched him. The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are Esau's. Isaac said, but he did not recognize Jacob because Jacob's hands felt hairy, just like Esau's. So Isaac prepared to bless Jacob. But are you really my son Esau? So he's confirming it again. Yes, I am, Jacob replied. So flat out lies to his dad to get this inheritance. And Jacob ends up winning. He gets this blessing. Here's the blessing, 28. This is what Isaac proclaims over Jacob. From the dew of heaven and the richness of the earth, may God always give you abundant harvests of grain and bountiful new wine. May many nations become your servants and may they bow down to you. May you be the master over your brothers, and may your mother's sons bow down to you. All who curse you will be cursed, and all who bless you will be blessed. Wow. A blessing was a binding agreement. You know, a lot of times today we we lean on contracts. It's written down. It's signed. It's notarized. It's official. Back then... If a blessing was issued out of the mouth of a father, it could not be retracted. The word was their bond. It was a binding contract. Esau comes in a little bit later, and he weeps bitterly when he finds out what Jacob has done. It's like, well, you didn't pay attention back when you were trading your birthright earlier, but now he wants to fight for it. Now he realizes what uh, that birthright could maybe do for him, where he didn't recognize it years before. And Isaac begins to shake convulsively, the text said. This this phrase is actually very strong. Isaac begins shaking when he realized that he blessed Jacob and not Esau. There was a deep sense that something had gone wrong with his plan to bless Esau instead of Jacob. He knew he had tried to work against God and his plan, his revealed plan, and God had beaten him. At this moment, Isaac realized he would, have always, he would always lose and he tried to resist the will of God. And he came to learn that despite his arrogance against God's will, God's will will be always victorious. If God said he's going to do it, it's going to happen. So here, I think what you have is four self-centered people, each seeking kind of their own advantage. They all did it their own way, all four of them. None of them did it God's way. In the end, they came up empty or compromised and paid a high price for their selfishness. We sometimes have a Sunday, Sunday school view of these heroes of faith, but when you get behind the curtain, you realize the level of dysfunction that they walked with And you just stand amazed to like, God, you could work through that level of dysfunction. And that gives you and I hope. Now, Jacob and Esau, and this time, I said Isaac's 137. Do you know how old the boys are? The twin boys, little boys? They're 77 years old and still hanging around mom and dad. Failure to launch, right? 77 years old. Rebecca's still in Jacob's ear, just like She was when he was a teenager. Hmm. If you're wondering, obviously, where Jacob got his conniving, scheming spirit, look no further than his mama, right? She was a pro. She was a master. Jacob learned from the best. What Rebecca needed to learn is that you don't have to manipulate or connive or angle God. Now, that's a trap a lot of us can fall into. Internally, Not that we would admit that to anybody else, but a lot of times in our own mind, we, we kind of make little secret agreements with God. Hey, he understands. Hey, I'm going to give myself a pass on this one. Hey, we're, we're all good. Rebecca needed to learn that she's going to reap. She's going to reap some consequences to her scheming. As Jacob... He rightly knew that God wanted him to have the birthright. He justified any lie or sin he committed in the pursuit of that birthright. He likely did so uh, telling himself that all this was for 
the righteous cause. He probably used the promise and calling of God as an excuse for sin. Have you ever tried that? How's that working out for you? It doesn't work out too well. And yet through all of this, God's doing his will, even though it's against Isaac's will, confirms Proverbs 19.21, which says, You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. Man, I love that verse. You can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. I love proclaiming that over the situations in our culture today. Lord, you can, they can make plans, but the Lord's purposes will prevail. You and I may have a dysfunctional relationships or family, but you have a functional, amazing, faithful God to you who does what he wants in the midst of all that mess. Which is lesson number three. God always fulfills his promises through messy people and messy circumstances. Trust him to do it. Trust him to do it. God wants to move powerfully through your life. Are you trusting him? Or is there fear or is there doubt or I don't have what it takes? Well, God says otherwise or he wouldn't have chosen you. You don't have what it takes. With this spirit, now you do. So Rebecca advises, now that this is all blown up, Jacob did what he did. Esau is super pissed. And so with reaction, Rebecca advises uh, Jacob to flee to her brother Laban. For it, so your, your brother's fury diminishes. And what was going to be a few days turned into 20 years. Jacob is with Laban for 20 years. Rebecca would die without ever seeing her son again. That was the price of her scheming. That's called your plan backfiring. Your fleshly scheming and manipulating backfiring. I can only think what the last years of her life were. They were probably miserable, lonely years as she was probably thinking of all the things that she put her family through. She would never see Jacob again. So off to Laban, Jacob goes, and he has no clue what he's in for. See, his uncle, Laban, had mastered deceit better than anybody. This is, the, this is Rebecca's sister, or brother, sorry, brother, mind you. Um, Jacob is about to go to school for 20 years. And what happened with Jacob and the deceit backfires against him. He deceives his dad, and so Jacob is going to get deceived by Laban. He goes to Laban, and he has a daughter, and uh, he falls in love with her. And he was willing to do anything. And so uh, Laban says, I'll make you a deal. You work my land for seven years, and you can have her. So he works the land for seven years. He walks up to the, he, he marries a daughter, and then realizes it's the older sister, Leah. And he's pissed. And so he's like, I made this deal with you. you got, he got deceived. He's experiencing the fruit of his own actions. And so he's like, it was the other daughter that you promised me. So he's like, well, work another seven, and you can have her too. That's the journey Jacob went on, a grinding down process. Jacob, you want to sow this kind of deceit? All right, you're going to experience the consequences of your own actions. And so by the time we get to chapter 32, God finally gets a hold of Jacob to bring an end to this deceitfulness and his deceitful ways. Many years later with both Leah and Rachel, his wives, like I said, you should read about it, um, and Leah's kids, they flee Laban. They're done. They're out of there. 20 years later, they're like, dude, we can't take any more, Laban. Can't live with you. And needing to travel through Esau's land, he sends ahead a massive gift. He hadn't seen Esau in all these years, but he has to go through his land. So he sends out all these gifts that would go before him. I mean, just massive amounts of goats, cattle, camels, donkeys. He sends his family away from the camp for their safety. And this is where we pick up in verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp. Now the next day he's going to see Esau. 
But a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Such a wild story. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What's your name, the man asked. He replied, Jacob. Your name will no longer be Jacob, the man said. From now on, you will be called Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name, the man said. Then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. It's this wild story. It's one of the wildest stories in the Old Testament, right? So here's Jacob. He's all alone in this encampment, and here comes this man. Now, you can see by, at the end of the verse, Jacob named this place that I have wrestled with God. I've seen God face to face. So there's something unique about this man. It could be an angel of the Lord. It could be what's known as a theophany, which is an appearance of God um, in, in physical form. And uh, let me get that definition. Yes, a visible display that expresses the presence and character of God to human beings. They're all throughout the Old Testament. But this one is rather unique. So Jacob and the man are wrestling. Sometimes we feel man can really contend with God. A man or a woman in rebellion against God might seem to do pretty well. The match seems pretty even in appearance only. God can turn the tide at any moment, and he allows the match to go on for his own purposes. It's not so hard to imagine Jacob working so hard and feeling like he's getting the best of his opponent until finally the man changed his nature, changed the nature of the struggle of the moment. Jacob left defeated which was God's intention all along. Surrender to me and my will, Jacob. This is an invaluable place for anyone to come to God, where God conquers us. There's something to be said for every man or woman doing their wrestling with God and then acknowledging God's greatness after having been defeated. We must know we serve a God who is greater than us, and we cannot conquer much of anything unless he conquers us. So Jacob was reduced to the place where all he could do was hold on to the Lord with everything that he had. He really wasn't wrestling at that point. He's just holding on. Jacob couldn't fight anymore, but he could hold on. That's not a bad place to be. Stop fighting God, but hold on to him and never let go. Israel means fight, struggle, rule. El means God. Or Isra. Isra means fight, struggle, or rule. El means God. So he renames Jacob. I mean, Israel, the one who, some take the name, is the one who struggles with God or he who rules with God. But in Hebrew names, sometimes God is not the object of the verb, but the subject. So Daniel, Daniel, which means God judges. He's not, it's not he judges God. So this principle shows us Israel likely means God rules. God rules. He's trying to get that message through Jacob. God rules. I rule, Jacob. You don't. Surrender to me. I've got plans for you, plans for greatness and much bigger than you'd have for your own life. Jacob would remember his being conquered by God with every step that he took for the rest of his life. He limped for the rest of his life. It was a constant reminder that he wrestled with God. So from here on out, it seems that Jacob begins to truly walk with the Lord and following what Yahweh tells him. So lesson number four, God wants to break you of your selfish will so that he can accomplish what he wants through you. It's a lot of times what he's after. It's just breaking you of your selfish will. 
so that he can do what he wants to in and through you. You know, maybe one of the, if you're a parent, maybe one of the best prayers you could pray for your own children might be or ought to be, God, break their hip. Break her hip. Stop them in their tracks and let them surrender to you. Let them end their deceitful ways. Let them end their need for control or their lust or their need for comfort. God, end that in their life. Break their hip. Call them to yourself because if that doesn't happen, the rest is worthless and meaningless. It's polishing brass on the Titanic. Unless God builds the house, we labor in vain. So, through it all, God's plan to call out a people and a nation to himself prevails using entirely messy, self-centered, unfaithful people. The promise of God, this promise of a nation to do what? Through that nation, he would send his son. And the promise of God's plan was fulfilled in Christ. He turned the tide, and the end of the story actually changes. So to land this, have a little analogy. You ever tape NFL games on the, you know, usually used to tape, you know, the old, the, what was that, VCR, TiVo, all that kind of stuff. You could kind of, you know, record the game. And, uh, you know, there's a big difference. If you, if you end up doing that and you record the game to watch later, do you ever find out? the result of the game before you watch that tape game, right? And it's like, dude, it always stinks. Well, if you, if you find out that you lost, the motivation to spend three hours watching a game completely diminishes, right? It's like, oh, I'll check next week's game, right? Move on. All right, we lost, whatever. But if you find out that you win the game, that you won the game, and you're watching the game, And the other team gets an interception, or the other team scores a touchdown, or the other team goes up by 14. How does your heart respond? It's not like you're watching it live. You're reacting live. You know your live reactions to when that happens. But when you know the outcome of the game, there's a stillness and a calmness that's like, hey, it's just a little hiccup. I know where this is headed. Hey, don't worry about that score. Hey, I know where this is headed. God told us where this is heading. It's God getting the victory. It's God coming out on top. And it's his people that is going to win with him. And so as, as we're out in this world and we're seeing, oh my gosh, look at all the enemy. Don't let that throw you off of who God made you to be of being led by the Spirit, because in the end, we win. And so therefore, live in union with God. Have a united vision as a family, and don't trade your birthright for anything. Trust God to fulfill His promise through you, and surrender to Him, and watch Him work in and through your life. And may He break all of us of our selfish will, so that He can accomplish what He wants to in us in this generation. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you, God, that, Lord, we know by the playbook you gave us, God, we win at the end. And much like we would watching an NFL game, God, I pray that we would live life in such a way that we know that we're going to win because, God, you promised it. And, Lord, when you issue a promise and a call, it comes to pass, as we've seen, not only in our own life, but we've seen throughout history. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would mark us, that you would mark us like Jacob, change our name, transform us. May we be your men and women that you've designed us to be. Let us leave behind our selfish ways, our old patterns, maybe ones that we learned from our own family, generational patterns that are having a severe impact on our life today. Father, only you and you alone, your strength and your spirit can break the power of that over our life and lead us and usher us into a new way. So, Father, I pray, Lord, this morning, that, God, we would, everyone here, God, live a surrendered life to you this week. God, we thank you that we're united with you. God, help us be reunited with 
those that you've surrounded us by, the relationships, the covenant relationships that you have us walking in. Lord, may, us be, may we be united, God, to give you honor and bring you glory. Father, if there's anything that we're trading our birthright for, anything of the flesh, God, right now, Lord, we lay that at the foot of your cross. God, we repent of coming under agreement with that. God, we repent of turning to those things before turning to you. Father, we pray that you would do a mighty work in our heart. And Lord, end this charade in our life. Father, I pray that you would fill that space with your spirit and lead us into your better way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.